Hi there, it's Karen Kennedy from Real Food Matters. And, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit today about pre-diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And if you've been following me or getting my newsletter, you know, I'm talking about this a lot right now. And I'm on a little mini mission to, um, to try to get a little bit of education out there because, you know, in my business, I'm an integrative and functional nutritionist. And I've been working in this field off and on since about 2001. And one thing I have seen over and over is people saying, well, the doctor says I don't have diabetes yet, so I don't have to worry. The doctor says I don't have diabetes yet, so I don't have to worry. So that begs the question, why should I worry about pre-diabetes? Why should I worry? Well, I want to tell you a little bit about it because, um, and on the, I'm going to link to this video. I have a little ebook that I wrote, I put together to try to explain what pre-diabetes is, why you should care about it, how you can get checked for it, and then what you can do about it. Because pre-diabetes isn't pre-anything. It's a thing all by itself. And having it, it's a silent killer, people. It's a silent killer of health. It is just, when you have it, it is just slowly and silently just eroding your health and reducing your lifespan and reducing your health span. So um, I want to teach you a little bit about what it is, why you should care about it, and sort of what to do next in this video. And But the, the link to the ebook, the ebook says a little bit more. And I made that also so that, you know, you might be concerned about your own health, but you also might be concerned about your, your partner's health, a parent, or another loved one, a friend. And this way you can sort of hand it to them and talk to them about it. Anyways, so I don't know how much you know about diabetes and blood sugar regulation, but pre, you know, obviously from the name that pre-diabetes, AKA metabolic syndrome is just sort of the prequel to diabetes, but it can go on for years, even decades before you have frank diabetes. So what happens, and I'll start at the beginning and I'll try to be brief, is um, when you eat any kind of carbohydrate or sugar, um, so whether it's a, a potato, some rice, some bread, some sugar or milk, you know, carbohydrates are found in starchy vegetables and milk and fruit in, um, and legumes and carbohydrates aren't bad. They're not bad. It's just, you just got to know how to, what their role is. Um, whenever you eat a carbohydrate, you you absorb glucose from that food. And glucose and sugar, I'm going to use those synonymously. And so when you eat those foods, your blood glucose or your blood sugar, same thing, they go up. Okay. And glucose is a fuel for your cells. Glucose is good. It goes into your cells. They have energy. They can do things. But your blood needs to regulate the concentration of glucose in it in a narrow range. So if your blood glucose gets too high, that's dangerous. If it gets too low, that's dangerous. You know, that's either hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. Both are bad. You want to stay in that narrow range, that baby bear range. So how does your body do that? Your body secretes insulin. Whenever you eat carbohydrates, then they need to get into the, some cells. You know, that's packing that sugar away into cells like muscle cells and fat cells. That's how your body... Um, regulates that narrow range of blood sugar. And it's also how it stores it for later, right? Because as humans, we're, we're, we're well adapted to toggle between cycles of feast and famine. So how do we do this? We use insulin. So we eat carbohydrate, your pancreas secretes insulin, and insulin acts like a key that sort of like opens the door into a, mat, a muscle or fat cell and then packs that glucose away and then shuts the door and then until you have just that right level of blood sugar, right? So insulin is your storage hormone. When insulin's up, we're storing that energy away. When it's a time of plenty, when you're eating after a meal. And then in times of scarcity, you know, that long overnight fast you do when you're sleeping or if you're fasting or just in between meals, when you're, when you don't have any more sugar in your system, then you don't need any more insulin. And then your insulin comes down 
And that tells your body, hey, let's release some of that stuff we stored earlier and we can utilize that stored energy or we would sometimes say we burn the fat, burn the fat. Um, let's utilize that to keep ourselves going in between. And that's how it works. That is that is just how our bodies work well. We toggle between fasting and feasting, storing and utilize stored resources. That is, and that's fine. But what happens when you never utilize those stored resources? What if there's never a famine? What if we are always in times of plenty, which is kind of, you know, in my world, it's always a time of plenty. The grocery store is open 24 hours a day. I always have stuff in the fridge. Technically, the kitchen is never closed. You can eat late into the night. You can wake up in the middle of the night, grab a snack all day long. You can sip on a latte. You can snack on crackers. You can just have a steady stream, kind of mainline glucose all day long. And while that's, that's a little bit of hyperbole, that's kind of what happens often with the frequent snacking, frequent meals, late night meals. Um, we end up never really being in that cycle where we're utilizing stored energy. So at some point, we might find that we have a lot stored and we don't need any more stored energy. Yeah. So our cells are sort of like, you know, when insulin comes a knocking and says, hey, I've got some more cornflakes and milk, and orange juice, I need somewhere to store this glucose, like, you know, sweeping something under the, the rug. Um, I need somewhere to store this so I can regulate blood glucose. And the cell's like, no thanks. We have enough. Thank you. It's like putting the no soliciting sign on the outside of the cell. Well, what happens? Well, if you can't get that glucose stored away, your glucose levels rise and that's diabetes. But what the body does is the body says, hold on a second, I can do one better. And your pancreas starts overproducing insulin. It produces more and more insulin until there's so much insulin around. It's like having, it's like being inundated with like 20 different salesmen at your door saying, surely you need another vacuum cleaner or you need another set of encyclopedias. This is what used to happen. Until finally you're like, fine, I'll take a few more. Just leave me alone. Um, and so you, you, you pack a little bit more in there until, you know, you just, you're storing a lot of energy and that does keep your glucose levels normal. It does keep your glucose levels normal. So when you go to the doctor and they test you for diabetes, they look at your fasting blood sugar in the morning, and then they'll look at your average blood sugar by testing the hemoglobin A1C. It gives your average over three months. Fine. Both of those might will still be normal for months, if not years and years while this is going on because your body, your pant, you can keep up with it. You can keep producing more and more insulin and you still don't have diabetes. Why should you care about this? You should care about this because insulin, that storage hormone, does far more than just control, regulate storage of energy. Having prolonged and higher levels of insulin will raise your blood pressure, right? So no, it's not COVID. It's, it's, it might be your blood sugar levels. It might be high levels of insulin raising your blood pressure. It can raise your cholesterol levels, especially your triglyceride levels can go up in response to high insulin. No, it's not the excess fat, it's not the butter, and it's not the eggs. It's probably your insulin levels in response to glucose, too many carbohydrates. So high blood pressure, cholesterol, mostly triglycerides. <clears throat> Spare tire, that is where you're gonna put weight on when you have high levels of insulin metabolic syndrome or prediabetes. Because think about it, if you eat your food, it gets absorbed, you know, goes into the portal vein. And it's just a matter of space. Where are you going to put that fat? You're going to store that energy kind of close to where it goes in, which is around, it gets stored around your organs. We call that visceral fat. And that visceral fat acts like an endocrine system and it causes an increase in inflammation. Total body inflammation goes up when you have an increase in that visceral fat. Isn't that interesting? 
So spare tire, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, fatty liver. We call it non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD. And doctors didn't see non-alcoholic fatty liver disease decades ago. That was only seen when it was, um, that was only seen with alcoholics, people who drank a lot of alcohol, they would store a lot of fat in their liver, but now it's with people with um, prediabetes or high insulin. So you have those things. And then all that insulin can affect your hormones. It can, um, it can alter your hormones and the pathway your estrogen takes and testosterone. So women will often get something called polycystic ovarian syndrome. And sometimes they don't even have cysts, but it gets lumped into the same thing where they, um, they, it causes them to produce more androgens, more testosterone. So you get a lot of facial hair, not the fuzzy hair, but really long, like have to shave facial hair. Um, and there's other symptoms. Um, it's hard to conceive. Um, your sex hormones just get all messed up. Men will often find they get erectile dysfunction. And that's because yeah, going, these are all symptoms of heart disease. You know, you, you think of these risk factors and you're thinking, oh, stroke, heart attacks, um, dementia. It's because it affects your blood flow and your, your vasculature. So, you know, you need some good blood flow for, um, for an erection. So men will often see uh, an erectile dysfunction first because that's a pretty, pretty sensitive place for blood flow. Um, what else there? Yeah, those, you'll also, you'll get a lot of brain fog and low energy too, just by how this works. So you see how this increases your risk of heart disease, stroke, and poor health, not feeling good already. And you don't even have diabetes. Yeah. So this is why I want people to think of because, you know, traditionally less so now, but when I first started talking about this kind of stuff around 2001, nobody was talking about it. And before we would address each one of these issues separately, you know, for high blood pressure, we'd say, oh, reduce your salt or take a medication. And there's nothing wrong with taking medication. I mean, blood pressure medication will save your life. But if you just take that blood pressure medication and don't address what's under that, then you still have all this other disease going on, wrecking havoc on your whole body. So um, no, it might not be salt. Lowering your salt might not help, but, and there's certainly other things you need to do. Um, high triglycerides, you know, everybody's going to say, you know, cut your saturated fat and cholesterol, stop eating all the eggs and the butter. And no, it's, I, I mean, I, I don't know what you're eating now, but chances are it's going to be regulating blood sugar that makes the biggest difference. Um, polycystic ovarian syndrome and hormone imbalances, you might get put on oral contraceptives. And, you know, if that helps you, that's great. But there's still an underlying metabolic issue. So why not address that? first or in addition to um, taking exogenous hormones. Um, so that'll help your whole health and not just the one symptom. Do you see what I mean? So, you know, I'm not against taking a pill to improve your symptoms. We all deserve to feel good. But in addition to doing that, also look at the root cause and find out what's going on so that you can, you can feel better. Um, you can feel better and maybe even, you know, get rid of that spare tire at the same time, because, you know, we all want to feel good in our bodies. And sometimes that helps. So um, I want you to think about that. And I have a list of like labs to ask your doctor for and things to look at. And I put them in this ebook, little ebook that I made to try to make this easy for you. Um, so sign up for that. And I'm going to be talking about this a lot because I'm like, I'm on my little mini mission about metabolic syndrome and prediabetes, because I think it's something like one in three adults in the U.S. have prediabetes and about 80 percent of them don't know it. They don't know it. You can re you can prevent this. You can reverse this. It's not it's not rocket science to reverse this. Just like you can you can reverse type two diabetes, which is what it leads to. But the longer you let it go, the more damage is done. And when you get into the diabetes, then that damage is done. So why not? add more healthy, happy years to your life and address it now and get healthy. It's not gonna ruin your life. I'm not gonna take away the butter. I'm not even gonna take away your coffee because I'm not supposed to do that. Um, but I do, you know, there's a lot of um, low hanging fruit on this one that you can do to really live better and enjoy your life more. So um, 
yeah, go get my ebook. And I'm going to be talking about this in my newsletter a lot more. So if you sign up for my newsletter, I'm going to be telling you more than you ever wanted to know about this topic, because I want you to be feel empowered. I want you to be able to take control of your health and be a better advocate for yourself. So you're a partner with your healthcare provider. I want you to go to your doctor with some information so that two of you can work together. Yeah. You can say, I, I know about this. What do you know? Well, I know this. Can you order me these labs? Sure. Um, and you're both learning and you're both working to the same ends. You know, that's the most, that's the most productive healthcare relationship. And I want that for you. All right. So thank you for listening. Again, my name is Karen Kennedy, Real Food Matters, and grab that ebook and learn about metabolic syndrome and prediabetes.